Good morning. This is Avram Shira from Nar Shalom. Uh, this morning we're going to tell the story of the birth of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. As it appears in the Rosh Hashiva of Nar Shalom, Rabbi Ben Shmueli's book, which is called Hilula Darashbi. It's a wonderful book. He put together everything you need to have the most amazing Lag Bomer in one Sefer. At Halavai, the whole thing wasn't translated into English for the whole world. But I guess the whole world doesn't speak English. We might need a few other languages. Nonetheless, it is a miraculous story, but in the way that Jewish miracles happen, in the way that um, things are not so difficult for our low human reasoning. Okay, so... The birth of Rashbi begins, Atana Eloki, Rabbi Shimon Baruch Hai Nolad, Bechamishim Shana, Lachar Chorban Abayit. Rabbi Shimon was born 50 years after the destruction of the Second Temple. Yom Lerito Enu Yadur, Mekom Mekom Yesh Omrim. His day of birth was not exactly known, but some say it was Lag Bomer, and some say he was born on Shavuot, the hog of the receiving of the Torah. And it's spoken about in a, uh, a book called Nachlat Avot that's written there in several s- stories that Yochai, Rabbi Shimon's father, was amongst the leaders of the generation. He was from the tribe of Yehuda, and he was wealthy, and he was honored, and he was also close to the Malchut, which meant, of course, the Roman government, which, of course, is a very sensitive position when the Romans were occupying Eretz Israel. And he was considered very ple- uh, loved by even though the, the Caesar, whose name was Adranianus, Shechuk <laughs> Atzomot. Wow, what a name. Adrianos, literally, Shechuk Atzomot means the one who wears down the bones. Now, why he got that nickname, I don't know. Maybe someone could do a quick, uh, a quick Wikipedia on uh, Roman emperor, emperors, but uh, that was his nickname. And Yochai's wife was named Sarah, and she was a daughter from the tribe of Yehuda, the princes of the tribe of Yehuda, I should say, the Nisi'im, which of course would include Rabbi Yehuda HaNasi, Rabban Shimon Gamliel, Rabban Gamliel Azaken, many, many illustrious figures from the family that originally emerged from Hillel Azaken, the poor homeless guy who showed up from Babylon and became the leader of the generation, uh, several, uh, 200 years before. Nonetheless, so his parents were very special people. And Sarah, unfortunately, like another Sarah in Jewish history, was not able to have children. Through the early years of their marriage, and when she saw that many years had already passed by, and she still had not had a child, And we have to remember, not having a child for a woman whose whole life centers on raising a family is much different than not having a child for a woman who's the CEO of a corporation and she's busy (laughs) running the world. There's a big difference between motherhood as you look at different cultures. And for a woman in her position, it was a, a very difficult thing. Okay, and so she had the idea that another Sarah had way back in the Torah, and she thought that perhaps her her husband Yochai the Tzaddik should give a divorce so he could have children and fulfill the mitzvah and build a family, or perhaps she should he should take another wife, which was still a, a common practice. This would be. 1900 and something years ago. 
And so what did uh, Sarah, the wife of Yochai, do? She went to a Shadchan, a marriage maker. And she asked the Shadchan to look for another wife for her husband. Not unfamiliar, right? Sarah had Hagar to look to. And, he, and she told him that she wanted a, a modest woman who was fitting and a daughter of good, a good family. And after a while, Sarah learned that Yochai had chosen the other option. That there is a very difficult halacha in the Torah that says if a man doesn't have children after 10 years, he should give a get, a divorce paper, in order to marry someone else and have children. Of course, nowadays, all these laws are seem very antiqui- antiquated <laughs> because we have so much technology that we can find out why a woman is not having a baby and why maybe it's the husband's problem and maybe it's her physiology and maybe it's her psychopathology. And of course, nowadays we can do in vitro and a, a woman can have a baby even from her own egg and her husband's sperm by somebody else. So there's a lot of solutions that have kind of stepped around these ancient laws. And, of course, part of the miracle of Torah is that it's constantly accommodating itself to the present, to the conditions of life that Jews live in over thousands of years. And so when you hear an antiquated law of the Torah, you have to think about it in context. If not, you're easily going to come to (laughs) some unpleasant conclusions about the Torah. This old, archaic, patronymical device that men use to dominate women. Well, that's not really the case. It looks like that if you don't know the context of every law. Nonetheless, she heard this very difficult news that her husband was looking and thinking about a divorce, and she didn't say anything to him. And she instead began to fast and to give charity and to pray day by day while she was alone. And she cried a great amount of tears before Hashem with a broken heart to save her from becoming divorced. You know, getting divorced 2,000 years ago was a little different than today. A woman who got divorced had little chance of getting remarried. She was taboo. And she went back. Usually the law says she would go back to her father's house. Who knows what that meant? It wasn't a very nice idea. And the idea of getting divorced might have been better than the idea of having a second wife nearby. If she happened to say, okay, Yochai, take another wife, and then we'll have a child through her, as the original Sarah Emenu did. But rather, Bruch Hashem, Hashem Shema Kol Tzakata. Hashem heard her cries. You know, I'll tell you a little story on the side. Once a woman went to the Lubavitcher Rebbe and said, I want a son like you. <laughs> That's a pretty direct request. And the Rebbe held out a cup. And he says, are you willing to cry this much tears? A cup full of tears? Like my mother cried? Well, we see this happened here. By another Garol Ador, By another great one of the generations. That Sarah, the wife of Yochai, cried such tears that God heard her prayers. Vayi Bele Rosh Hashanah, it was on the night of Rosh Hashanah, and that's another auspicious time we know, and it's also the time that others of the patriarchs and matriarchs of Judaism were <clears throat> were conceived. 
And on that night, Yochai had a dream. And in this dream, Yochai saw a great forest full of beautiful trees. Tens of thousands of trees, the text says. Very big forest. And there were those trees that were filled with fruit and foliage. And there were those trees that were very dry. Dead, in other words. The Yochai, he came to rest upon one of these dead trees. We saw Nav and he lifted up his eyes. Vehine ish mida. And there was before him a man of measure. Now, in a dream, a person can appear 10 feet tall, no problem. Bigger than an NBA center. Marehu Norama Odin, his image was awesome to look at. Val Shechmo Nadahad Malemaim, and on his shoulder was a water skin. And this awesome looking man, which usually when we hear of this in the Talmud, it means an angel that takes on a human form for the sake of delivering a message in a dream. So when you see a dream with a person that you don't recognize, maybe there's a reason you don't recognize him. And this awesome looking person was going around with his water skin watering some of the dead trees. And then there were other dead trees where he wouldn't water. And he came to the tree where Yochai was resting and he took out from his little satchel, his purse, a small jar that was filled with Mayim Chaim Tohorim, the text says. Pure living water. Now it's interesting, Mayim Chaim, in the simple sense of the word, means water drawn from a spring. Not from your faucet, and not from a swimming pool, but from the earth itself. There's a reason for that. There's a reason why a mikvah is considered a vessel of purification because it's attached to the earth. And the earth is a self-healing entity. The earth is constantly correcting itself, not becoming too hot or too cold, too wet or too dry. Over the centuries, we see these patterns of weather that the earth is constantly correcting itself. When there's too much pressure within the earth, volcanoes erupt, islands are formed. And guess what? Those islands become new habitations for life that otherwise would might not have a place to live. And so on and so forth. The processes of the earth show us its perfection and its balance and its ability to correct even the acts of human beings. Sometimes. <laughs> and this man in the dream took out his jar of special living water and poured poured it on the tree that Yochai was leaning on. And he saw a great blessing was staying with that living water. And he became uh, very uh, inspired. And this whole area around this tree became covered over. With leaves, the tree instantly started to grow in the dream. Vaz tekif nasailan pri, and then the, this tree that suddenly came to life brought forth a fruit. A great, special, precious, precious apple. Now, this apple was not from Silicon Valley. 
and there were many beautiful leaves around this apple. And the tree, the tree continued to grow very tall and, and, and prosperous with great leaves and fruits, giving out a beautiful fragrance that spread a great distance through the forest. And Yochai was very joyous on what he saw in his dream, and he woke up from his sleep very happy. Now, just to add another detail, when you wake up from a dream and you're happy, it's a good sign that it was a good dream. And if you wake up from the dream very agitated, you have to start checking out why. And if you don't, well, we'll see what happens. Nonetheless, Yochai woke up and he was very happy. And immediately he started to mutter a verse, which is also called in Masechet Brachot uh, a tiny prophecy. Moshivi akert abayit ema banim smecha, hallelujah. The one who brings back the baron of the household, a mother of children who is joyous, praise the Lord. Of course, this is a uh, piece of Tehillim that we say in Hallel. And many women have had this joy of not having children, and then suddenly they've been able to. Now, I, probably not many fathers have had this dream. <laughs> but we've had some pre pretty special dreams and occurrences about birth. Well, that's for another time. We saperet halomoli ishto. So... Of course, Yochai told his wife the dream <coughs> that I dreamed this dream and its understanding, its pitaron, its explanation seems very simple to me. That the forest is the world and the trees are the women of the world who give forth fruit. And then there are those that don't give forth fruit like those dried out, those dead trees. And on Rosh Hashanah, women uh, become pregnant, especially special women who have a certain job. And of course, Rosh Hashanah is the time that God decides that certain babies will be born by certain women and certain women will not have children that year, etc. Va'at, my daughter, Yochai said to his wife, it was a common way of speaking to your wife, to call her your daughter. It's kind of cute. You, Sarah, were the tree that I was leaning on. And the man in the dream watered you from the waters of blessing to have many righteous, holy children that would be very wise. Uh, but there's still one thing that I don't understand from the dream. Why all the other trees were watered from the big wineskin he carried on his shoulder and the water that he used for watering the tree I was leaning on was from that little jar. And he poured the whole jar on the tree I was leaning on. And no other tree had received from that jar. And so Yochai went on to say to his wife, Your wonder is a wonder. It is a wonder. I don't understand. And so Yochai said to Sarah, Permit me to go visit the holy Rabbi Akiva and to tell him the dream. And he will tell us the further interpretation of what's going to happen. 
And he said to her, my daughter, it's a very good thing. That we should go together to Rabbi Akiva and tell him the dream. And in his Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh of Rabbi Akiva, that God had given him, he will tell us the true interpretation of the dream. And, of course, his wife agreed. So after Rosh Hashanah, the two of them went together to the Tana Rabbi Akiva ben Yosef, who is called the father of the Mishnah. Even though Rabbi Yehuda Anasi wrote down the Mishnah, Rabbi Akiva was considered the father, the father of the Mishnah because of the fact that he was one of the few survivors after the Beit HaMikdash was destroyed that was able to save Judaism, to save the Torah, to, to continue the line of oral transmission. Nowadays, you know, God forbid, if somebody leaves us, he leaves behind his books. And there are endless versions of books, and there's no danger of Judaism ever losing its materials of transmission, which, of course, are the Mishnah and the, Tal- the Talmud and the latter <clears throat> rabbis who wrote many, many laws. Nowadays, everything's written down, but back then, everything wasn't written down. Back then, you needed to pay someone a tremendous amount of money to sit down with a scroll and write out a book. You couldn't just go to a store and buy a book. People didn't read, except those who went to the academies. So we have to understand the context again. How precious the transmission of Judaism can be when the Romans are occupying and destroying and salting the fields and and diverting the waters and corrupting the people. There's nothing more than they wanted than to, to stop Judaism. If you stop Judaism, you have no problem with the Jews. And that's what all occupying forces want to do. They want it to be easy. They want, you to, they want you to let them enter their country and take over the resources and run the government and do everything nice, and you're just a good little servant. That's what they all want. As horrible as it has been. So, Yochai told Rabbi Akiva the dream. And he interpreted the dream just like Yochai had said about the trees, the living trees that are giving fruit and those trees that were not, and the tree that he was leaning on that suddenly sprouted alive and came off with beautiful fragrances and fruits. And then Rebbe Kiva told him the reason why that awesome-looking man watered her tree from this special jar. And he said, you should know, Yochai. Halomcha hu mashal al anashim ayoledot avakarot. Your dream is a mashal, an, an example of of those women who give birth and those who are not able. And your do- your wife was one of those women that had that very difficult decree of not having children. And remember, a soul is born with a certain collection of traits and destiny is attached to every soul. We do not believe that God leaves anything to chance. If we believe in chance, we push God right out of the equation. So when it comes to this idea of chance or destiny, it really is a black and white world. But of course, we're talking about in heaven. In heaven, the world is very black and white. You know good and you know evil in heaven without any doubt whatsoever. Down in this world is where all the doubts and the confusions occur. Where the faith or the fallen faith are constantly struggling inside us. But there's one thing that we, part of this faith is faith in destiny. Is my life really the life I'm supposed to be living? Or is there, are there certain details left to chance? I could have been born in California or Florida or New York or anywhere. No, we don't believe that. 
once we introduce doubt about one detail of your life, that doubt is like a, a little virus that just wants to keep growing, spreading more doubt. And that's the way evil operates in our mind. A little doubt about this law and a little doubt about that. And all of a sudden, it's a virus. Has v'shalom. So we have to understand that there are two worlds. The world of clarity and the world of confusion. And guess where we are? Okay. So Sarah was one of those women that just had that decree upon her for whatever reasons that she wasn't going to have children. Now we know that was also the case with the original Sarah Imenu. She if Charlotte Lolid was Shumofen that that was the decree that she would be a woman that would never have children. Rak al yedet tefiloteha, rak al meoteha, asher shafcha lifnei Hashem. But only because of the prayers that she poured out before God and because of the charity that she gave, ziku ota, she was given the merit, and the decree was turned over that she would no longer be barren. And she would give, ch- have children and bring them into the world healthy and happy and whole. And that jar of water that you saw, that was the jar of the tears that she spilled, praying not to be divorced, not to be left barren. And from those tears, this tree was watered, that she would have children. And therefore, it wasn't Shayach that that, that the man in the dream would pour that special water from that jar onto any other trees. Only the tree that Yochai was leaning on. So Rabbi Akiva continued and said to Sarah, Behold, in this year you will become pregnant and you will have a son who will illuminate all of Israel with his wisdom and his amazing deeds. Which we will learn more of these amazing deeds uh, through the course of Lag Bomer. Tomorrow morning, hopefully, we'll continue with live at 11.45 and we will learn more about the greatness of Rashbi. And they were very grateful and joyous from what Rabbi Akiva had told them. And they went home in peace. And Yochai knew that the dream would come true and his wife became pregnant and they had a child, it says here, on Haga Shavuot, when the Torah was given to Israel. And the house, when the baby was born, was filled with light from the glory and the splendor that was poured upon it. Interesting, back in the day, you know, everybody did a home birth. And... Um, It's not so co- uncommon in certain places, in certain areas. My daughters have given several home births, and they're very happy. And the children are very, very uh, healthy. And no one came after them with a shot. <laughs> when my first child was born, the nurses came after the baby to give shots. And I took the baby, and I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. We're just going to take our time right here. And this was 24 years ago. 24 years ago, we were already worried about vaccinations. We'd already done research. And I'd already worked with autistic children. So, you know, everything's in context. If you don't know the context, we don't know anything. I took the baby from the nurse and I said, I'll take care of the baby. And we took the baby. We brought her to the, after the head or leda, the birth room, to where they put all the babies. And we stood there and we waited and we watched. And thank God, our daughters and our sons are are very healthy, and they all have had a little bit of measles here and there, and they all got better, and they're all stronger. And, you know, trust in God has to be everywhere. 
all this craziness about vaccinations, if they were so, why are they so crazy about vac- vaccinations? Shalom. Apparently our, our bandwidth is getting a little challenged over here, out here on the mountains of Israel. Maybe we'll have to just have to buy our own satellite. You know, we'll give NASA a call. Anyways, so they they were very happy there, and uh, they praised Hashem, and they gave out a lot of charity, which is a custom at a Brit Mila, especially after a husband and a wife have not had children for 10 years. And they made a great fe- festive meal. And they, on the day of the bris, and they called his name Shimon. Ki shama Hashem tfilat imo. Because God heard the prayer of his mother. And to the voice of her crying. And from that di- day, they put their eyes upon the child to guard him from all types of impurity. And uh, there's lots of types of impurity that nowadays we're not terribly familiar with. Well, because we're not so educated. But like a dead mouse, for example, is not something that you want to leave in the house. Right? Or or even a dead lizard. (laughs) That shouldn't be too hard to figure out, right? But there's other types of impurity. And uh, it's a a learning that's worthy of knowing. And uh, I know that there are stories about the previous uh, Rebbe that they would wash the baby's hands from the time it was born, Natila Yadayim. There are stories about putting a baby in a silk bassinet, that his um, skin would be smooth. We know that certain fabrics can even be impure by various reasons. So without going into a lot of the details here, they guarded the child and his holiness, and that includes the food they were, he was given. Okay. This is going to be the end of the story and the end of the shear, folks. We will see you tomorrow with a continuation of, of the, the, wor- the works and the deeds of Rabbi Shimon Be'ochai in honor of his Hilula. And Rabbi Shimon, he was from the fourth generation of the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash, which was 3,890 years after the creation began, according to the Holy Torah. So I hope this was a, an interesting story, and there's much to be said about dreams. In, the, in our big early classes on Facebook, we did a whole series on dreams from Masechet Brachot and 